Special thanks also um, to the Cambridge Partnership for Education, who have been instrumental in organizing this month's panel. Now I'd like to briefly introduce our panel for today. Dr. Zhu is a lecturer at the Faculty of Artificial Intelligence in Education of the Central China Normal University, focusing on digital literacy, performance evaluation of e-learning and educational data mining. She has published about 20 articles on digital literacy and was approved as the head of a youth project of the National Natural Science Foundation of China in 2021. Lloyd is a curriculum development manager at Cambridge Assessment International Education, where he works on curriculum projects involving computing and digital literacy. He collaborated on the Cambridge primary and lower secondary digital literacy curriculum and support materials, and led the very recent computing curriculum and support materials, which was launched in September 2021. Our third panelist, Laura, has recently completed her PhD in dialogic education at the University of Cambridge. She works on the Inquiring Learners Project, developing innovative resources to teach children to think and talk like scientists. She's interested in how dialogic education can help children to navigate the online world, particularly with regard to fake news. Lola has a background as a teacher and regularly carries out philosophy with children work in schools. So welcome to all of you uh, panelists. And with that, we will now ask Dr. Zhu to share her screen and start her presentation. Dr. Zhu. Dr. Zhu, you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself, please, that would be great. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank can you. you hear me? We can hear you clearly now. Thanks, Dr. Zhu. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm Zhu Sha from Central China Normal University. And it's a great honor for me to have the opportunity to speak at this seminar. And I will uh, introduce the research of our team on digital literacy in China. And the report uh, is how to promote K-12 students' digital literacy, empirical studies and implications from China. I will introduce our research from three, uh, three parts uh, since I have only 10 minutes, so I will uh, introduce the first two parts briefly and focus on the third part. Mm, the first part is about what is digital literacy. As we know that ICT will take a big step every 10 to 12 years, uh, 15 years, and technology hotspots continue to emerge, such as AI, big data, and we are uh, due to the new technologies, uh, it has uh, we have seen this whole transformation in all walks of life. So under this background, digital literacy has been uh, regarded as an essential literacy for students to live and study in the society. In order to promote students' digital literacy, global organizations and many countries have issued related policies or action plans, for example, UNESCO has uh, published a global framework of reference on digital literacy skills. And about 10 days ago, Chinese government has published an action plan for improving digital literacy and skills for all. So uh, as our research team, we have conducted very extensive literature review on digital literacy. And um, scholars have different views of digital uh, literacy. From our point of view, we think that digital literacy refers to the ability of individuals to use digital technologies appropriately to access, manage, integrate, and evaluate information, develop new understandings, and communicate with others in order to participate effectively in society. In our previous studies, we also use information literacy to indicate the same meaning. Uh, we think that in order to effectively 
uh, improve students' digital literacy. The first thing is to understand students' status quo of their digital literacy. So uh, we think that the first thing is evaluate. We have developed an assessment framework of students' digital literacy. We think digital literacy uh, of K-12 students include four main dimensions. The first is awareness and attitude, reverse to one's sensitivity to information about things or things of interest. The second dimension is knowledge and skills, reverse to one's mastery of information related theories, methods, principles. And uh, the third is thinking and behavior, which reverse to one's thinking and behavior of using information technologies to solve problems in their study and life. And the last is society responsibility, reverse to one's moral principles and understanding of the rules governing information activities. Based on the assessment framework, our research team, uh, research team has developed assessment tools for K-12 students' digital literacy, followed by the three steps and these are our sample items of our digital literacy test. We also develop our assessment system to evaluate students' digital literacy. In the past uh, five years, we have conducted several times large-scale digital literacy assessment in China. And till now, we have connected more than one million samples of primary and secondary school students. So uh, next, I will focus on uh, two empirical studies of our study. And the first is uh, about influencing factors of digital literacy, which was published in the Asia Pacific Education Researcher. Based on the social cognitive theory, this study mainly examined personal, behavioral, and the environmental determinants of students' digital literacy. For example, uh, personal determinants include students' ICT self-efficacy, students' ICT interest, and uh, behavioral determinants include in-school and out-of-school ICT usage. Environmental determinants include factors of parent and teacher's level. And we have uh, using regression analysis to achieve uh, some interesting finding. The first finding is that students ICT self-efficacy and ICT interest were positive determinants of their digital literacy. And uh, students in school and out of school ICT usage were not related to their digital literacy. We think that the possible explanation for this result may be that students uh, use ICT very frequently, but they are not pedagogically oriented, so uh, maybe uh, may have not see a uh, positive impact on their inf uh, information literacy or the learning. And the second finding is that parents' ICT usage and ICT interest were positive determinants of their children's digital literacy. Second, uh, thirdly, we found that teachers' ICT self-efficacy and collaborative ICT usage were positive determinants of their students' digital literacy. However, interestingly, we found that teachers' positive ICT attitudes and ICT usage were selective determinants of their students' digital literacy. We think that uh, the possible explanation may be that teachers who have positive ICT attitudes tend to use ICT very frequently in classroom and using the most recent, most emerging technologies maybe have the negative results because uh, they uh, may there exist some problems such as abuse of technologies. So uh, I uh, think this study have very important implications for how to improve students' digital literacy. And we, Propose four suggestions. Firstly, 
Students' ICT self-efficacy and ICT interest should be promoted by increasing the development of basic ICT-related skills. Secondly, high-quality ICT usage activities are necessary to develop students' confidence. For example, teachers could uh, encourage students to use ICT to solve problems in their study or life. And certainly, teachers must be made aware of appropriate ICT teaching uses instead of abuse of technologies. Fourthly, professional development programs that emphasize engagement and learner-centered pedagogies should be implemented to improve teachers' ability to better use ICT in classrooms. And the second study was published in British Journal of Educational Technology. This study was to explore the parent profiles in terms of their ICT proficiency. We measured parents' ICT proficiency level from five aspects. Parents' ICT usage, ICT attitudes, ICT support for their children, ICT rules set for their children, ICT self-efficacy. And very interestingly, we found three distinct parent profiles. Queensland users, compliant users, and active users. From this figure, we could know that most parents were compliant users, and only about 12% parents were active users. They have the highest score on these five dimensions. And more interestingly, we think uh, we found that students whose parents with highest ICT proficiency level tend to perform better on digital literacy tests than others. So uh, we think that this study have very important implications for how to improve students' digital literacy from the aspects of parents. First, we suggest that Schools should organize public lectures to convey the importance of parents' ICT proficiency in the cultivation of their children's digital literacy. Secondly, uh, su we suggest that schools should provide opportunities for regular parent-school communication to help parents identify and understand their important role in the cultivation of their children's digital literacy. Thirdly, we suggest that schools could provide training for parents in basic ICT knowledge and schools. Fourthly, it is suggested to conduct workshops, organize face-to-face -face information sharing sessions, and provide online platforms for parents to discuss how best to manage children's ICT use at home, including how to provide appropriate support and set restrictive rules. Lastly, we suggest that it, uh, we should develop homework projects to increase parental involvement in children's ICT use at home. So uh, these two studies provide very uh, important implications for how to improve students' digital literacy from teacher, parents, and student level. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. I mean, that was, that was really interesting with your empirical evidence, and I'm sure the implications are things that uh, the panelists and other participants in this webinar will be chatting about and discussing uh, and uh, in connecting them with their own experiences. Okay. Uh, following this, Lloyd, may I request you now to share your screen and uh, start your presentation, please? Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm going to present on one perspective of digital literacy by describing how it is represented in our, which is Cambridge, Cambridge International's um, digital literacy curriculum. Um, it is a subject within our primary and lower secondary program and is therefore aimed at global learners age five to 14. The curriculum was launched in September 2019, following about two years of research, which included the research included discussions with various in interested parties 
is about what they did want and what they did not want young learners to be able to do when using digital devices. And these interested parties included teachers and school leaders, subject experts, but also internal colleagues of mine who are looking at the role of digital platforms in future assessment and other education scenarios. For, for, for Cambridge International and Cambridge Assessment, one initial motivation was that we felt we could not expect learners to take on screen assessments until they had a deep rooted familiarity with the tools that they would be using for those assessments. We didn't want the, the assessment to be about using the tools, we wanted it to be about the assessment context, uh, content. We also read in our research various reports about uh, and journal entries about safety, about what it means to be a digital native, and most significantly, what the term digital literacy actually means. And there were various, various views on that. One thing that soon became clear to me, however, is that digital literacy is, is not a stationary concept, and therefore that our, our curriculum needed to be adaptable to ever-changing technology and to ever-changing platforms, and also to the changing ways of, of using them. It was therefore developed, identified early in our development process that adapt, this concept of adaptability was also one of the key things that we needed to support our learners to develop. Sorry about that, the mouse was a bit keen this morning. Um, just to explain the Cambridge and primary lower secondary programme is part of something that we call the Cambridge pathway. And this pathway takes learners on a complete journey through primary and lower secondary and onto their IGCSEs, their O levels and their AS and A levels. And it now even includes an early years offering in, in, in some regions. The primary and lower secondary programme itself is delivered to 6,300 registered schools in over 140 countries. Examples of how learners can use our digital literacy curriculum as part of their preparations for their later education and also to support their adult lives can be explained by the free content strands for my curriculum and these are displayed here. Firstly, it is in the tools and content creation strand that learners experience using a range of software for creating digital artifacts, such as when they're typing or producing multimedia presentations. But we are clear that in our curriculum and teaching support materials, that digital literacy is not about following a how to guide for using certain software. We instead advocate that learners be supported and encouraged to investigate the software for themselves because this will equip them to apply their discoveries to given tasks and also equip them to make further discoveries about new software tools whenever they encounter them in the future. The content creation strand also in, contains progressive content that supports learners to develop and apply online research and critical thinking skills that again can be applied across a range of resources and research scenarios. Just as we didn't want the tools and content creation strands to be tied to today's technology, we also didn't want the safety and well-being strand to be presented to learners as a list of narrow rules about what they shouldn't, should and shouldn't do when using digital devices. A rationale or one of the rationales for this came from a forum I attended where it was asserted that, that, that safety rules are, are a barrier. And once that barrier has been pro broken and quite likely without any initial consequence, it could set a dangerous precedent for future rule breaking. So we didn't want young learners to be breaking rules early in their lives to in, therefore risk encouraging them to break further rules later on. Therefore, our teaching materials include a range of things that young people need to be aware of, such as the risk of speaking to strangers and of sharing content that can have longer term implications. But the key for us is that our learners develop strategies that enable them to pause, to think before they do anything of consequence when using a digital uh, device or platform. And the consequences we talk about range from saying things that could be potentially hurtful, providing an opening for a malicious individual, or even neglecting the opportunity to do something that is more active or physically social. The third strand, the digital world, explains how technology is constantly disrupting established ways of doing things. 
Disruption is a key word that we use throughout, but we make it clear that it doesn't need to be a negative word. Digital disruption often carries a range of benefits and risks, and these vary depending on both the circumstance and the viewpoint of the individual. So therefore, we assert that part of being digitally literate is the ability to make an assessment about those benefits and risks. Briefly, I'm going to um, describe how the free content strands are applied to learners of different ages, starting with our younger, younger primary learners in stages one to three. Learners of this age are supported to develop the motor and recognition skills that allow them to interact with on-screen items and to use these to create simple digital artifacts. The early safety content focuses on privacy, the importance of passwords, and also on identifying and sharing any concerns with a responsible adult. In terms of the digital world, the younger learners begin to recognise a range of tasks that use computers and also recognise that technology and its uses is subject to constant change. In our stages four to six, learners begin to interrogate the tools that they have available and to find their own ways of combining media to suit their interpretation of a given brief. They also begin to conduct conduct their own research using a range of functions and they are made aware that content that is placed online is published instant, instantly and, then, and that in most circumstances it is then impossible to remove. The digital world strand in the digital world strand at these stages the focus is very much upon disruption and the positive aspects of this. Moving on to our lower secondary stages, and therefore learners aged 11 to 14, we challenge these learners to create increasingly sophisticated digital artifacts and provide them with scenarios that enable them to consider the accuracy and validity of, of their resources. And this includes recognizing the fact that many content creators have specific motivation for the information that they create and post online. In the safe, self, safety and well-being strand, we have moved towards personal responsibility. And, and in the lower secondary stages, we really focus on the long-term impact that an individual's digital activity can have on their future selves. The digital world strand at these stages focuses on communities and a range of factors that both join us together and divide us digitally. I would like to briefly mention the aims of our lower secondary curriculum, which are very similar to our primary version. And the key messages here are that digital literacy is about empowering learners to use technology safely, about protecting their emotional well-being, but also while reflecting on the opportunities and issues presented by technology from a range of different perspectives. Our overall view of digital literacy is, is about developing transferable skills, about making informed decisions about the information we encounter and about assessing the impact that technology and our interactions with it are continuing to have on both individuals and on society as a whole. Ultimately, we want to support our learners to become contributors to the digital future and not just passive consumers of fear or, 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 or young people who are fearful of what digital technology can bring. Finally, uh, I thought it worth mentioning what has happened to our curriculum since it's launched, because I've certainly been talking about it a lot more since the start of COVID lockdown and homeschooling. And as part of the discussions I've had around that, I've heard that some teachers are picking bits out of the curriculum to even educate themselves to become confident users. And we, we keep coming back to this recurring message of, of doing things that you feel comfortable with and, and preparing to use the tools that are put in front of you. I've also recently presented on the role of parents in digital literacy, and it was interesting that a lot of what I said there echo was echoed in what in what Dr. Zhu said earlier. So I won't spend time that, um, talking about that just now because it's already been covered. And finally, and it was mentioned when I was introduced, we have also launched a new subject called computing, which sits alongside the digital literacy um, 
curriculum, but is is vastly different um, in that it is more technical and it covers content such as computational thinking, programming, and how networks and computers themselves sales function. So that's everything to me. I'll hand back to Shashank. Thank you very much for listening. Good. Thanks very much. And it's really interesting how um, much of what you're doing at Cambridge International mirrors the research that Dr. Zhu um, talked about. And, 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 and that's really the beauty of what's happening, the interplay between research and practice um, that's taking place. Uh, I'd just like to remind all everyone that you can post your questions in the Q&A um, uh, box. And uh, depending upon how your Zoom is set up, you'll find that uh, uh, I probably at the bottom somewhere. So please use that to post your questions. And of course, use the chat function to um, um, explore ideas and themes that you might want to speak about on the sidelines. Right, um, after Lloyd, uh, Laura, uh, you're up next. And I would uh, request if you could share your screen and start your presentation, please. Absolutely, I'll just share my screen now. Okay, uh, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, um, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. My name is Dr. Laura Kerslake, and I'm a researcher on the Inquiring Learners Project, um, which is a DEFI project and um, run out of Hughes Hall at the University of Cambridge. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how that project came to be and some of our initial research findings and our next steps for the future. So uh, under the Inquiring Learners banner, um, our flagship project was called Inquiring Science. And the aim for that project was really to help children to think like scientists, but also really considering um, the ways in which they found, used, evaluated, and then reported information. We also looked at um, ways of knowing and different types of reasoning. So that then led to the Inquiring Online project, about which I'll talk a little bit later. But the, the characteristics of both of our projects, Inquiring Science and Inquiring Online, is that um, we, they're research informed. Um, they were developed with educators. So we, we've talked to teachers um, and practitioners and science leads in schools. They're aimed at children age eight to, to 11. So in the UK, that would be to stage two. And they are oracy or discussion-based um, resources. So they take um, an approach where children can have an opportunity to discuss, share their ideas and, um, and learn from each other about, about the different issues that they're, that they're talking about. So each set of resources um, is a 10 week set of lesson plans and photocopyable resources to support small group and whole class activities. And they also include stimulus stories. So each session would start with a stimulus story that's based around, as you can see the little logo in the corner, that's based around the fictional Galileo class. And that's an example of one of the characters in the stories called Grace. And the idea is that children are able to become familiar with these characters. And as they, um, as they encounter the problems that they face in the stories, the children are able to um, to work together to help children solve those problems and think about how it applies to their own lives and their own experiences. So as I said, we carried out the Inquiring Science um, trial first and we had some very interesting findings because we, we, we administered a baseline and a final assessment and we asked children questions around manip uh, manipulating and using information um, and also around things like um, facts and opinions and finding and using appropriate headlines and also um, how much they trusted different sources of information. So some of our key findings from that project were, I think one of our main findings was that children do not trust the internet. Um, we, we asked them to complete the assessment, but we also uh, video recorded children working in groups of three 
to who were conducting a, an equivalent assessment and we recorded several comments on lines of um you know you can't trust the internet the internet lies um and i think what children weren't doing was differentiating different aspects of the internet so they they treated it as a singular whole rather than understanding that there are different websites different sources of information and so from that we we realized that actually children really didn't have those kind of abilities and skills or experience in being able to um to discern the differences between different sources of information so they didn't have that ability and as part of that, I think these, these further three find, main findings about stem from that issue. So children very much struggled to differentiate between facts and opinion, especially where facts and opinions were presented in the same sentence. Um, and children also found it hard to use sources of information. And by use, I mean, find the appropriate evidence within sources of information to answer the questions that they were being asked and they very much relied on their prior knowledge to do that even when and this is quite interesting even when their knowledge was was um contradicted by the evidence and sources they 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 clung to the beliefs that they already had and that's a very interesting finding for digital literacy and finally children did not have effective group work strategies and that's an issue because um, they, they were unable to work together really to solve these problems. So instead of proposing ideas, reasoning with each other, rejecting ideas, asking for more information, they would just do sort of, um, they were working groups of three. So things like two against one strategies, or even in some cases, just randomly picking an answer where they didn't know um, and just persuading everybody to agree with it. And I think all of these findings mean that children's digital will struggle with their digital literacy and I think they, they mean that they do not have a high level of digital literacy. So from these findings we decided to, that our next project was going to be the inquiring online project to really address some of these research issue, research informed issues that we found with inquiring science. So we then went on to develop inquiring online and some of the so it follows the same form as before so we have the the stimulus story and the small group and whole class um activities and the subjects covered are things like finding information fact checking and um, considering fake news and also images considering bias and facts and opinions and also sharing information both from a critical and a social perspective and I'll just explain what I mean by that a bit more, because I think it's really the, the hub of what we're trying to do here. Um, so one issue that we found is that children, um, so children in England, well, actually, uh, children in, in terms of social media platforms, um, they're not supposed to have access to certain platforms before a certain age. So when we're considering primary school pupils, we need to think about what is it that children are going to have access to are they going to have um, Facebook accounts or be on Twitter? And below a certain age, some children might have access to those, but others might not. So really what we're looking at at that younger age is the kind of social behaviors that will later lead to good online digital literacy, particularly in the area of digital citizenship, which is what most of our resources kind of really focus on. Um, so in our resources, we look at the reasons why people share information and actually we we really highlight that okay so you come across something online um you may choose to to fact check it to look for other information to to try and find out whether it's true or not but actually it's more likely that if it's if you find it funny or it really accords with beliefs that you already hold that you can hit a share button um without kind of carrying out those checks beforehand. So although we do focus on the critical aspects of so the critical thinking behind sharing information, we also look at the social aspect. Um, and so several of our, our sessions within the inquiring online resources focus on um, getting children to understand within a context that they'll have experience of. So for example, gossip in the playground or one child um, 
not being very nice to others or children ganging up on each other. And then we relate those kind of experiences that they will have in their primary lives to, um, to the online world. And by doing that, it means that we, we, we marry their experiences with later behaviours that they'll exhibit to a greater degree when, when they have more of an online presence. So our next steps um, for the project is that we are carrying out ongoing research trials. So our, our next trial will be for inquiring online and we're recruiting participants for this trial starting, uh, the trial will start in early 2022. I'm very sorry about that. We're already in 2021. I've let the years get away from me. Um, and so what we will be asking participants to do is that teach, for teachers to take a baseline questionnaire to understand their own digital literacy and digital competence and that of their class. So very much linking in with, um, with what the previous speakers were talking about. We'll also ask children to take a baseline assessment to, so that we can find out about their digital literacy. Then teachers will teach the, the 10 inquiring online sessions. The children will take a final assessment, so an equivalent one to find out about their understandings of things like fact and opinion, their ability to use information. And then we'll also ask teachers to complete a final questionnaire, again, around to see if their understanding has changed and also to see what they, what their understanding um, of, their, of what their class is now doing has changed. And we're also going to recruit some schools to be case studies so that we can really understand how the, how the resources are being used, if they're useful for children and teachers, um, because our research is, is design-based research, so at, ongoingly we will use that information not only to understand how they work and um, that they, if they work or not, but also how they work and how we can make changes within them to make them more useful and more relevant um, for teachers. Um, and I think that's important because, as Lloyd was saying, you know, digital literacy is not a static concept. Um, and so, as we are recruiting participants. If anybody is interested or knows anybody that would be interested, we, we would like to, we've only conducted these trials in England so far, but we, we would particularly like an international component. So we have the assessments are online and we've placed the resources online. And so that means that the whole thing can be conducted remotely. Um, so our website, which is up there is inquiringlearners.org. And then we have two email addresses. So the project email address, as we're carrying out the inquiring online trial, is inquiring online. And then that's my um, my Hughes Hall email address as well. So if anybody is interested, then please do get in touch. And we'd love to hear from you. And thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. And uh, um, I'd just like to remind everyone that the uh, webinar itself is being recorded and will be available on the DEFI events website. Um, uh, and Barry has put the link in the chat, as also will all the presentations. Now, do continue to send your questions in because we've received a lot of questions in advance as well. And um, I'm going to just sort out some of them and start addressing them. Uh, please do forgive me if I pronounce your name incorrectly as to who um, has actually given the question, but I will try and do my best. Right. Um, so perhaps I'd like to begin with a question, um, which, I mean, I, I think all the three panelists can actually address this, uh, which has come in from Heidi, um, which is an interesting question about what kind of digital classrooms should institutions have after the pandemic? Um, so over to all three of you, if you'd like to address that. Um, I'll start in that case. Um, obviously, in a large part, it's going to be determined by the resources that they have available, um, which is obviously going to be a limiting factor. But I think the the key thing, as much as the, the lockdowns and the po pandemic of, of I, I mentioned the word disruption several times in, in my presentation, have caused disruption, um, I, I would hope there are examples of benefits where um, students have, 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 have become stronger at engaging online um so there's 
let's let's keep that going you know let's let's, let's find a way of embracing the the face to face what you know the, what all teachers are good at but also retain that space for, for for things like collaboration activities between students where they where they can where they can do it in li- online do it using digital devices collaboration obviously online prepares them for the mo- helps prepare them for the modern world but from a practical point of view if if two two students are sharing the same computer it helps reduce the um, the uh, requirement for resources which is obviously a, a big benefit as well dr Zhu, laura anything anything you'd like to add to that Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Zhu, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'm not very, um, uh, uh, digital uh, classroom, um, I'm, uh, I'm not made, uh, my research uh, interests uh, may be not majored in this, but I, I can uh, say something about that. I think um, a digital classroom should have uh, several important features to improve students' learning. First of all, I think uh, it should have very um, good uh, interaction interaction between students, between teachers and students. I think interaction in digital classroom is very important and students should get immediate responses from their peers, from teachers. And uh, secondly, I think, uh, digital classroom should support uh, data-driven teaching in this society because um, with the development of AI and some um, several products with the function of um, data-driven teaching, for example, um, teachers could know very um, could know students. Uh, the mastery of their knowledge and uh, uh, could get could provide them very personal guidance. So this is very important. And the guidance should uh, um, the guidance and suggestions from teachers should be supported by the data uh, related with students' learning. I think uh, this is very important. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and 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 I think uh, this link between research and what what works and what doesn't, and how that will play into design of school classrooms, um, is going to continue for some while. But uh, there's always a time lag that we have to take into account between when the research shows certain evidence and when they get play, played out with the kind of investment that's required in digital classrooms. But you know, it's not always all positive. And Lloyd, I'm going to direct the next question to you in terms of how uh, you guys are planning at Cambridge International to look at some of the you know, negative elements that come in through digital learning. And this is a question that has come from Xi and uh, uh, talking about the, some of the negative elements of digital learning, for example, the potential impact on the eyesight of children and uh, staring at computer screens and devices over a long period of time. And uh, maybe you can address how you factor these kind of things in into your planning. Sure. I mean, we talk about it as being part of digital literacy and this whole concept of, of, of balance. Sure, if you spend all day at a computer, either in an education setting or, or gaming or whatever else, you, you, you are posing risk of, of eye strain, repetitive strain. Um, but as much as anything else, the opportunity cost of the fact that, you know, if you're a young person, you're not out with your friends, you're not pursuing sporting activities or, or, or face-to-face social activities. So I think it, there's um, part of it is, is educating people and young people in particular about the risks of, of, of eye strain. The fact that there are real examples of that are, a tool that can be used to support that understanding. Um, but as I say, also talking about opportunity costs, but also recognizing the, the benefits of using computers and things like um, 
you know, prolonged periods of of um, constant prolonging periods of concentration in in younger learners. So so there's a balance of, between a the amount of time spent on uh, using the devices, but also a balance between focusing on the risks and 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 the benefits to 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 doing that. Well, thanks, Lord. I'm going to actually um, move on to a follow up question that she has, uh, which also links up with the question that Russell has about uh, um, exclusion and inclusion in uh, digital literacy. And she talks about the fact that uh, uh, classroom sizes in China and many other parts of the world sometimes can be very large and uh, not all students can get access to um, even small shared screens um, on that. And uh, um, Russell had an interesting question about um, um, young people and getting them back into education and to employment. Um, they might lack basic literacy skills, but sometimes they're excellent at online gaming and social media. And so Laura, may I direct that to you um, at first, and then perhaps the other panelists could, could also chip in. Yeah, so the question was about um, children's or young people's abilities with gaming and social media, but not with other skills. That's right. And, and how this could be a mechanism to get them back into education and then into employability, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a difficult one. Um, so I've recently been carrying out some research in a HE context um, and you know, in a higher education context. And, and one of the findings from that is that even where children, or where young people, sorry, were competent, and confident users of things like social media, um, it was less so with regard to other digital literacy functions. Um, and then I think there's also an issue around kind of the gamification of learning as well. Um, and, and I think as Lloyd was saying, it, it's something important to take into account of a balance between um, more screen time and also um, doing other things um, and, and engaging in other ways. But I think that one particularly important factor of that is, is around um, children engaging with each other. So children who online game may do so in conjunction with friends and be very used to talking to people online in that context. And, and I think um, going back to what, what both of the other panelists said earlier around that issue with digital literacy and digital classrooms, that interaction between between pupils and also between pupils and teachers is a really important thing. So I think perhaps maybe one one way of, of re-engaging people with education is to ask them to take part in quite social activities online using the tools that they have available. Thanks, Laura. And, and in, in fact, I'm, I'm going to move on to a question um, um, from Manoj that uh, relates to what all three panelists have been saying and, and moves it into the direction of what support is needed from the policymakers, right? Uh, is there an enabling framework of policy that needs to be put in place or modified in order to make, uh, uh, for example, the curriculum innovations that Cambridge International is doing or to be guided by the research uh, that Dr. Zhu and Laura, both of you are doing? Uh, what do you feel the interplay of policy should be with research and practice in this area? To all three of you, actually. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll start with that's okay. I was just reflecting on that um, within the UK context because we, um, we very much have a or in England certainly have, have a knowledge-based curriculum. Um, and I think that sometimes the focus can be on, so the focus is certainly and rightly on e-safety, particularly at younger ages. Um, but I think um, one of the downsides of that is um, that children, as we saw in our research, just came to find that they didn't trust the internet. You know, their parents had warned them, school had warned them. Um, so I think actually, in linking policy with practice and research, we need to move away from a kind of 
a deficit model of you know children can't do this and children shouldn't do this to actually looking at the positives and a positive engagement with digital technology and the internet and and really when we look when we're designing curriculum and when we're putting policies in place it needs to have that focus on you know, the, these are the really good things about the internet um and this is how you can access it safely competently and effectively okay in, in china i think um school leaders of china uh, of chinese schools attach great importance to ict use in education so i think uh and they have uh, widely used all kinds of ICT in uh, the school settings. So I, I think we do not need to uh, tell them the benefits of ICT. So they, they, they will uh, um, accept it and use it very well. So uh, I think uh, from the from our research, I, uh, we have conducted a research about schools' information level on students' digital literacy. And we found that uh, schools with higher information uh, level, ICT level, uh, their students will have higher digital literacy level. For example, if a school has very uh, uh, advanced ICT infrastructure and uh, teachers' application of ICT uh, was very good, and uh, uh, the software resources uh, about uh, teaching and learning are very um, enormous, and uh, the, their students' digital literacy uh, were better than others. So I think a school play a very important role in their uh, students' digital literacy, and school leaders should um, uh, attach great importance to this. In China, uh, they all acknowledge it, yes. I mean, Lloyd, just a follow-up question for you, given that you work across the world and not with any one specific regulatory framework or policy makers. I mean, how, how do you factor in national policies into the work you do on digital literacy uh, at Cambridge International? Um, one of the early points I mentioned in our research, one of the early things we do is is obviously find out what the appetite is for for certain curricula but certainly when we were developing digital literacy and computing one of the other things we we needed to gauge was you know, the availability of the of the technology it's all very well developing these curricula um but the technology needs to be available to support them the where my where I probably can't offer too much of a view is obviously I'm, uh, we work mainly with international schools who are you know, potentially well resourced or better resourced than, than state schools in certain areas. So it is potentially difficult for me to talk about. But um, one thing that's become clear to me just recently is how um, in, in, in all regions of the world, but it, it is, it is how governments and ed educators and ministries of education are really recognizing how important computing skills digital skills are to the future of the economy um so, you know, it's, it's it's a it's a fact I'm, I'm going off piece a little bit but it's a fact that there are in 10 20 years time there's not going to be enough computer programmers available unless we do something about it and the same has really got to apply to to those that are going to be working in the offices and using the outputs from those those computer programmers in in the digital sphere so it's 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 necessary i'm afraid uh thanks lloyd um you know i'm, I'm, I'm actually going to we've got about uh 10 to 15 minutes more for questions. So I want to just move it in the direction of uh, something that uh, Lloyd, you did, Dr. Zhu did, and, 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 and Laura, you also touched upon this, about the central role for parents in enhancing digital liter literacy, um, and of course for teachers as well. But, but let's, let's just focus on the parents a little bit, on the dynamic of parents with the school system, parents with their children, and parents with digital literacy. 
Um, your research clearly identified that um, it's really important for the parents' ITC literacy and digital literacy, um, um, and that has a knock-on effect on the ITC and digital literacy of the children, right, on it. Now, how can we, what possible mechanisms can you think of for um, enhancing the interplay between schools and parents, specifically relating to digital literacy? Uh, can they walk in step a little bit more? Um, Dr. Zhu, you did suggest some uh, implications and, and suggestions of how schools can reach out to parents, uh, but perhaps all three of you could maybe elaborate on that a little bit about how to include parents a bit more in enhancing digital literacy. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to share the uh, arranging of our ideas uh, because in the context of China, uh, we think that parents are highly involved in their children's study. So uh, we hypothesize that maybe parents have very important impacts on their children's digital literacy. So we designed uh, the study and uh, we designed a survey for parents and uh, to examine parents' ICT proficiency level. And the uh, parents' ICT proficiency level include five uh, aspects uh, in my report. I, I have um, introduced the five aspects. And uh, we using uh, we use uh, latent profile analysis to uh, try to classify the uh, different uh, categories of parents' ICT proficiency level. And we very interesting found that teachers uh, parents were divided into three groups, and most parents were compliant users, and uh, they scored medium level in all the five uh, aspects. And the active parents scored highest on the five uh, dimensions of the ICT proficiency level. So uh, next, we think that maybe there are different groups of parents, uh, they have um, different impacts on their children. So uh, using uh, regression analysis, we found that students from uh, students whose parents were active users, they have significantly higher digital literacy level than others and the students uh, whose parents were Queensland users have the lowest digital literacy level. We think that uh, this finding is very interesting and very, uh, we think it is in accordance with the uh, practical situations. Because uh, we, we think that um, parents' use of ICT and their attitude toward ICT, as well as um, their ICT uh, using uh, the ICT skills will have uh, impact on their children. So uh, I think the research findings has um, is is very in accordance with the actual situation. And from this study, we think that uh, parents should be aware of their important role. I think um, maybe they ignored the role is um, in their children's digital literacy cultivation. So uh, first, the first thing is to uh, make parents aware of their important role. Secondly, uh, uh, several, um, several measures should be done to improve parents' ICT proficiency level. For example, um, to uh, conduct workshops or training for parents to uh, help them know the importance of ICT in their children's learning. Because uh, some parents, uh, they may not very acknowledge, uh, they may not acknowledge the benefits of ICT in their children's learning. They think it will uh, have negative impact on their children, but actually, uh, uh, I think parents should transform their ideas of ICT 
So uh, this is the first thing. Secondly, we think that uh, parents should set restrictive rules for their children's use of ICT because uh, children, um, their children maybe uh, use ICT um, more uh, for, for purpose of entertainment or social media. So if the if their parents don't have restrictive rules for their children, I think uh, we think that the the children's digital literacy may not uh, may, um, will have negative impact. So uh, that is the second thing. And uh, lastly, we think that um, teachers should know how to guide their children to use ICT appropriately in their for the learning process uh, purpose. So uh, we think that parents, uh, sh parents' role should be highly um, acknowledged as uh, from the perspectives of school leaders or educational uh, administrators. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Zhu. Lloyd or Laura, would you like to add something to that, please? Okay. Um I've sort of heard anecdotally from heads of schools, particularly in the UK, you know, the issue that they face is engaging parents like they will, they will organise e-safety meetings and you know, in the evenings or whatever for parents. And it's the, the, the thing they've, they've really struggled with is, is getting the buy in. They'll organise these ev evenings with, with low attendance. Um, so one of the things we've discussed with, with sort of you know, our, our experts is a way of engaging the the parents through through the learners encouraging the learners to talk to their parents um one of the things we we talk about throughout our curriculum is the pace of change recognizing that the digital office is a far different place to what it was 10 years ago um you know i i, I i've got young children but um you know i first started working in office, office environment in the late 1990s when i sent an email for the first time so actually you know, in creating activities where the learners can talk to their parents about their experiences of, of change within within the digital workplace and then talk to them about what they do with computers you know the 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 message around how how do the young people feel if they're out for a family meal with their parents or on the on looking at their phone all the time or how do the young people feel you know when they become aware of the, the value of their personal data. How do they feel when their parents are putting their pictures on Facebook, you know, three, four times a day, creating the scope for those discussions that kind of are driven through homework activities or classroom activities where the learners actually talk to the parents and, and engage them that way. It's not an ideal solution, but it's, 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 it's something that can be pursued. Um, yeah, and just just to add um, on what's been said already, I think so. I have, I have two two points to make. The first is that um, we didn't explicitly look at the role of parents, but in some of our results, when we were asking children about the sources of information that they trust, parents actually scored very highly. And I think that's because we were working in a primary context um, where children still do go to and rely on their parents for lots of things. So I think um, it's very important that parents have. The, the appropriate and right information that to then be able to give their children because um, I think when we were listening to children discussing their views about the internet it was almost as if their parents voices were coming through them you know they were saying that you could always hear the parents speaking in the background talking about the dangers of the internet and not to trust it and the internet tells lies and things like that um, so again I think it's educating the parents as I was saying before about the positive aspects of the internet um, not only how to keep children safe but also the wealth of other things that can be done. Um, and secondly, I think there's the, the difference there between digital natives and digital immigrants, so people that have grown up with the internet and technology versus people that haven't. Um, and I think that the danger there is, is confusing confidence with competence. So children, parents might be astonished that, you know, their relatively young child is able to um, you know, work out the password for their smartphone and, and open certain apps and play games and things like that. Um, but it's not that in and of itself. It's not really that astonishing. Um, it's just that parents are surprised that their children can do it. But that doesn't take it 
that doesn't consider the steps in developing children's competence or digital literacy. So the, as I was saying before, the access around, around accessing and using information and, and, and digital learning as well. So I think those are the, they're the two main points that I would make. I'd like to just pick up on uh, something you said, Laura, about the fears of the internet and fake news and fake images, which is a um, 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 question that has actually been asked by Mahendra. And there's a, uh, it's also related, or maybe I can link that up with a question from Lee about the relationship between digital literacy and artificial intelligence and AI literacy. And uh, talking about, uh, Lord, you mentioned this in your presentation as well about how your curriculum tries to give uh, students and children the tools to be able to develop judgment on um, you know how to handle the internet and uh, uh, distinguish between fake news and things and so if I can combine those two things about digital literacy AI um, developing judgment um, and again throw it open to all three panelists to see what you might want to say about that Okay, shall I start? Um, AI, it, it's it's discussed within our digital literacy c- curriculum, but it's very much from a you know, how it's being applied less th- and less about how it works, how it's being applied, what the benefits and risks are. Um, but it's actually our computing curriculum where we look at how AI works and how it's being applied in in industries, how it's being applied in agriculture to control you know, self-driving tractors or or whatever else but in the digital literacy curriculum it's about creating the awareness that it's here it's here to stay it's an emerging technology so you know it's by no means in its its final version at the moment but um i, I think we use it more as a tool of illustrating how how thing you and ex, using it as a an example of how things are changing and and the pace at which things are changing Thanks, Dr. Zhu, can I pass that on to you as well? Okay, uh, I think uh, digital literacy has a broader scope than AI, uh, than AI literacy. Uh, as I, I think uh, AI dit- uh, literacy focuses more on uh, students' awareness of using AI technologies and uh, uh, students' knowledge and skills about how to use AI technologies to solve problems, and the students uh, mm, uh, some their uh, ethical awareness related with AI technologies. I think uh, they're more focused with AI technology, but digital literacy have more uh, have a uh, broader scope. Uh, they Mm, focus more on students' um, abilities related with using digital technologies. So um, to some extent, I think digital literacy could include uh, not part of AI literacy. That is my point. Thank you. Laura? Would- um, I can't. I can't really comment on the AI aspect, but um, just want to pick up on what you're saying about the, the making judgments. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we take that discussion based approach. So um, I think part of it, we, so we use the, the UNESCO definition of media and information literacy. And part of that is around information literacy, both on and offline. Um, so it's not like um, that information or skills or competences are being siloed. Between the on and the offline world um, but what we're looking to do is really connect those behaviors across um, in different curriculum subjects and I think that's really what good schooling should do in order to be able to develop digital literacy skills right from an early age even when children aren't using the internet for, for research say um, but there are certain behaviors um, critical thinking judgments kind of those social judgments um, that I think should be implemented early on, even in the offline world, and then connections made to the online world. Thanks, Laura. I, I think I'm, um, I'm going to pick a question from Roy and paraphrase that a little bit. Um, and Roy has observed that while working with schools in the UK and globally, that sometimes traditionally high achieving students haven't taken to the digital world as well as students who are not necessarily 
as engaged in the traditional academics. So, which really talks about that, is there a kind of student who flourishes in the digital world might be different to the kind of student who does well in a more traditional learning environment? And what does that mean? Um, so, so, Roy, I've just paraphrased your question a bit, but I'll throw it to the panelists. And have you had any um, experience or research which has looked at comparing students in a traditional, non-heavily digital learning experience and those in a more strongly digital experience? And do different kinds of students flourish in these two different environments? I mean, all three of you, whoever, whoever has a view on this. Yeah. Um, I'll just jump in first and very quickly just to say that, um, no, I don't have any experience with looking at different sorts of students, but I do think it sounds like it would make an excellent research project. Um, that's a very good question. Again, I think for us, it's more came it's more something we've considered with with the computing curriculum and the computers you know the the role of the computer scientists the tradition traditional view of the computer scientists that we're trying to kind of ch challenge as it were um but also looking at you know the roles within computer science industries for those with other skills be it artists um storytellers whatever else but not we haven't really looked at it from a digital literacy perspective other than looking at the the plural of digital divides and 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 why they exist but not not from sort of the 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 perspective that's been described in the question well that's an excellent research question i think going forward but um uh, we've got a minute left so what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask the three panelists for some final comments that you might have very briefly and let's go in reverse order um laura beginning with you first um, so, I mean, my final comments, I think, would be around making all of the necessary connections. So between parents, teachers, children, across policy, practice and research, across online and the offline world, looking at information in different contexts. Um, and I think that's the way that we can engage as many people as possible, but also look at, do some bigger picture thinking around um, moving definitions and, and things on as, as the landscape changes, um, which it will do rapidly. Thanks, Laura. Lloyd? Okay. For me, probably touching on a few points that have, have been made today, um, including the, the availability of resources and the fact that some students are more, in, more or less engaged. It's getting get the students talking with each other it's uh, if we're talking about e-safety for example a teacher standing at the front and saying you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do that actually getting the classroom sort of getting agreement um uh, as to what should be acceptable behavior what people do to keep themselves safe possibly hearing about the risks that 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 others take and sort of you know, helping them to see that way so um, I think digital literacy can be supported by a lot of classroom discussion and as much as anything it could be a great way for a teacher to learn about what their, their learners are doing because today's platforms aren't going to be tomorrow's platforms I think is a, a key point. Uh, Dr. Zhu? Okay, uh, I, I think uh, improving students' digital literacy is a, a systematic project which uh, needs efforts from students themselves, from parents, uh, teachers, schools, and the whole society. Uh, their efforts should be combined to improve students' digital literacy. So uh, I, I think uh, this is on the, for, uh, the first thing. And secondly, I think uh, it is very necessary and important to uh, evaluate students' digital literacy. Because uh, if we did not know students' status quo of digital literacy development, we could not uh, provide very targeted um, suggestions or uh, for policymakers, they should 
um, it should very uh, targeted po um, policies to improve students' digital literacy. I think uh, that's the two things I want to emphasize. Thank you. Well, that's been a really, really exciting and interesting um, conversation. And we are now, unfortunately, out of time. Right? And so Dr. Zhu, Lloyd, Laura, the DEFI team, and all of you participants who've made this a really engaging webinar, uh, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at the next DEFI event. Thank you and bye. Thank you.